The material that you're about to listen to and engage with came from our 2017 Missiology Lectures when myself, along with my colleague Johnny Ramirez Johnson, said we need to do this next 2017 Missiology Lectures on this topic of race theology and mission. And we invited Dr. Love Seacrest to engage with us in that process. We wanted to explore the challenging questions regarding racism and ethnocentrism and xenophobia and all of those issues from the perspective of world Christianity with regard to how these realities have existed in many parts of the world and also as part of the colonial mission endeavors. It is fascinating to think that the realities we were talking about are not the experiences of one individual or even one society. We're talking about whiteness as a way of defining the world. And the conference and the conference presenters address time and again this epistemology, this way of making meaning. It has also been described as colonization and post-colonization. The question is not, it's not about guilt, it's about engagement. It's about what are we going to do with what we have inherited. Uh, so the fact that we're having the conversation should not point a finger at you as a listener or viewer. But these are hard conversations. Um, the conversation about race is one that has been deferred for so long and so often over and over again. As soon as we get close to having a meaningful conversation about race, um, we recoil from the pain of it. And so in our lectures, there are, you'll see some of that pain emerge. You'll see some people who have long experienced racism uh, express and, de and declare and name experiences that they um, have had that have been deeply formative, deformative even. So this conversation is not a pretty one, but we're having it. As observers, as uh, listeners, you will be engaging and we invite you to invite the Holy Spirit the three of us pray a lot about this series. We humbly submitted to God and pleaded for God's mercy to lead us. We are feeble and combined. We are imperfect. And we have prayed that the Lord will fill the gaps. And the conversation is only a starter. It is in your hands. It is in your community. It is in your family. And most importantly, it is on your knees. Mm. Still, <laughs> still. Um, first, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Amos Young, Love Seacrest, and Johnny Ramirez Johnson for inviting me to this uh, gathering of saints to reflect on the topic of race, mission, and theology. I'm also very grateful to, uh, to them because they put me in the 11 a.m. slot, all right? <laughs> Uh, because as a historian, the biggest fear you have is to put your audience to sleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I guess that, 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 that was one of the uh, first things that my mentor and, and uh, mentor friend and, and advisor told us when we were studying at Boston U. Um, the task of the historian is to really uh, make history alive, something that you can touch, smell, feel, and if you um, do that job, do that task on your writings and your speaking, you are uh, doing what you were supposed to be doing. Um, my topic today is uh, constructing race in Puerto Rico, um, the colonial legacy of Christianity and empires, 1508 to 1910. Have you ever wondered about how race the first between the mainline and the U.S. colony of Puerto Rico. 
as in the case of missiology in which contexts shape interpretations of reality based on understandings of God, scripture, and human beings, issues of race are also contextually propagated and implemented. This presentation unfolds a long and complicated history of race in Puerto Rico. First, it describes the history of the status of purity of blood in Spain, which serves as the first background to understand the concept of race in Puerto Rico. Second, a description is offered on how the concept of purity of blood was transformed in Puerto Rico to preserve social dominance based on the place of birth and traces of African and Amerindian blood. Third, when the United States took possession of Puerto Rico in 1898, they encountered a different environment on racial issues than the one they had back home. The first Protestant missionaries were amazed at the mixing between the races and praised Puerto Rico as a place where racism didn't exist without understanding the deeper notions of race and class in the island. Finally, um, as I see it, the perpetuation of racism based on notions of sameness um, constructed around terms such as mestizaje, mulates, are still operative as central images in Hispanic or Latin theology. The farther we move from 1910, the less I have to say about the topic. The last section will simply raise some questions and critique on how some terms have uh, become part of a theological canon of Latino Christianity without some distancing or, and critique on how those terms came to be. Um, so let's go to the first part. It turns out that we have to go back um, in history to understand the racial, uh, racialization process in Puerto Rican society. Scholars have argued for good or bad that the mixing of races is the foundation of Puerto Rican identity, which starts in the nexus of colonial Spanish power, the church, the Amerindian and African populations. So the annexation of the kingdom of Granada with Castile accomplished the, uh, by the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella in 1469, play a crucial political role for the formation of what is known today as Spain. Um, there are some events as the reconquest, right? The Guerra de la Reconquista. Um, and some people have uh, interpreted the chronicles of the king's court as events or as providential signs of the grace of God to the kings. And the events represented the political power as the battle to implement the Christian faith. Thus, the words of reconquest and both the secular and religious dimensions, on the one hand, it was an armed movement of expansion in search of richness. And on the other hand, it was a religious holy crusade against the ideological religious enemy, Islam. Despite the importance of these events, research, recent scholarship on the social and economic history of Spain has taken another route to understand the period. Instead of talking, um, taking a political event as important as 1492, which symbolized the union of the kingdom, the expulsion of the Jews and later of the Moors, and the discovery of the new world by Christopher Columbus, Historians are proposing an approach that reveals a creative tension and continuity between the Middle Ages and the modern period. In this transition between the Middle Ages and modernity, one aspect that guided Spain was the concept of purity of blood. Spain adhered to status of the purity of blood, which originally served as a mechanism to exclude converted Jews uh, from participating in important positions in government and in ecclesiastical positions. In other words, color was not the main element in racial identity or ethnic identity, but religious difference. As Spaniards were more intent on excluded people on their basis of their Jewish heritage. 
In actuality, the statues of, of purity of bore, uh, blood were directed mostly towards judíos conversos or uh, com Jew convers, Jewish converts. So the seal of the Roman Catholic Church in the Iberian Peninsula against the Jews dates way back to the fourth century when in the Council of Elvira, Spanish ecclesiastics tried to protect Christians from Jewish contamination. For more than 10 centuries, or sporadically returning to the topic of anti-Judaism, by the 14th century was intertwined in Iberian society. The main sources to construct this reality uh, were the Bible um, and pretty much um, the church fathers. The Bible narrates many events based on the genealogical lineage uh, of its protagonists. For example, Genesis 4, uh, Genesis 5, Genesis 9, 10, as you can see in the PowerPoint presentation, uh, give the genealogy of many peoples uh, in the in the construction of the Bible. Also, the, the Bible presents this notion um, of the visitation of the sins of the parents as hereditary by the sons until the third and fourth generation. Um, the ancestors of Jesus also are represented in the Gospel of Matthew in, and Luke with two different genealogies. And it's important that Matthew 27, 25 reads, all the people answer, his blood is on us and on our children, and was interpreted as the eternal guilt uh, of the Jews for killing Jesus. So in this sense, the Bible uh, represents this conflicting narrative between biological and moral issues. Also, the Church Fathers um, have something, uh, some conflicting views on human sexuality, sin, and morality. Um, the example of the correlation uh, between sexuality, sin, and morality is best described by St. Augustine. Um, according, to, uh, according to Justo Gonzalez, for example, Augustine, uh, for Augustine, the result of original sin is that it involves all humanity as a mass of perdition, subjugated to death, ignorance, and concupiscence. This last one is mostly expressed in sexual intercourse, intercourse because as fallen beings, humans are incapable of having sex without objectifying the other person. In this sense, even marriage for Augustine was more, no more than a device to control and loss and concupiscence and as transmitted to every child born, born under the, in the world. So with this biblical and theological rationale, Spaniards saw Jewish people as disciples of an irrational doctrine uh, without an exit and condemned for eternity for killing Jesus of Nazareth, the savior of the world. So the seal of the Christian religion at this period was not on, um, the only factor uh, in persecuting Jews, but also political and economical, uh, economic capital. In a hierarchical society in which honor was derived from lineage, occupation, and property of land, honor operated as a symbolic and actual power. Therefore, it should be guarded and protected, especially against Jews. Um, in the 14th century, there were Uh -huh. In the 14th century, um, there were many anti-Jewish decrees. For example, in the course of Zamora in 1301, Valladolid in 1322, Madrid 1329, and the Council of Salamanca in 1335. And pretty much it was to take away the control of the final, uh, financial system that was run by Jews. This animosity against the Jews for the financial and political capital culminated in a great persecution in Seville in 1391, in which thousands were killed and their properties were taken away. The persecution spread like a wildfire to Cordoba and to the north, and by August, the majority of the provinces in Iberia were complicit in persecuting Jews by killing them and taking their possessions. So as you, as you can imagine, after such a persecution, uh, Jews converted to Christianity in mass. So it is estimated that just in Valencia, 100,000 Jews converted to Christianity that year. 
to escape the slaughter and pillage of their properties. So the conversion to, the, to Christianity, to survive the persecution and preserve their possessions, brought an assimilation process in which uh, new converts were taking part again in all aspects of social, cultural, economic, and religious life as new Christians, new conversos. The otherness of the Jews that was visible through their clothing, religious celebration, custom, dietary rules, and housing disappeared from sight. However, such invisibility meant that many of the religious practices, dietary rules, and uh, customs continue to exist, exist in secret. The issue of identifying then authentic versus false Christians uh, produce a great deal of commotion within several institutions, especially the religious orders. And by the mid 15th century was feeding suspicions that new court, uh, converts were threatening on, uh, to undermine the Christian religion, the Christian faith. As conversos were gaining positions of power, rumors of crypto-Jewish or crypto-Jews, uh, conversos who continue to practice Judaism in secret, multiply, prompting the Catholic kings, Ferdinand and Isabella, uh, to implement the Inquisition in Castile. Therefore, a new legal definition to identify new converts emerged by giving prominence to their past of or origin that was traceable only through bloodlines. So the first law passed was in Toledo in 1449, when the constable of the town stated that, quote, all the aforesaid converts, descendants of the perverse lineage of the Jews, in whatever, uh, whatever guise this may be, should be held as the law has and holds them as infamous, unable, incapable, and unworthy to have any public and private benefits uh, and, and, and office in the city of Toledo. So the main argument of the statutes of blood was that in the blood of the new converts, despite their conversion to Christianity, remains the seed of indecency, immorality, and heresy. Thus, they cannot be trusted in their claims of being new converts to Christianity. So under these foundations, uh, the status of purity of blood increased in the 15th through the 17th century as pretty much uh, determining uh, what job can you have in, in Spanish society. Now moving forward to how those statues of purity of blood were transformed uh, in Puerto Rico. As, as you know, there were no Jews or Muslims uh, in Puerto Rico. They were Aboriginal um, Amerindian people. The first blacks um, that, or who arrived uh, to the New World did not came from Africa, but from Seville, Spain. Blacks, Moorish, and Morisco slaves, Morisco means um, uh, Muslim people convert to, converted to Christianity, and freedmen in Seville were part of those first expeditions to the New World. For example, by 1475, black slaves had a whole neighborhood unique in Spain to its, uh, with its own police and chapel in which Ferdinand and Isabella appointed Juan de Valladolid, a black royal servant, as the mayoral or the steward to serve as a judge to settle the quarrels uh, and defend them against their masters. Facing many um, difficulties in Seville, some black freedmen saw the opportunity of a new beginning in the new world. Also together with black slaves, um, there were many freedmen and free women uh, who accompanied their former masters to the new world as servants and maids. As you know, it was not until August 12, 1508, that Juan Ponce de Leon began his colonial enterprise in San Juan Bautista. That statue is in the middle of San Juan, uh, reminding the Puerto Rican people um, of the first conquistador in the island. Born in 1460 into a noble family in Cerva uh, Santa Vera, Valladolid, Spain, Juan Ponce served as the assistant in the Royal Court of Aragon. 
He later became a soldier fighting in the Spanish campaign against the Moors in Granada and had distinguished himself in the uh, wars against the um, natives of Hispaniola. Because of his skills as a soldier, Nicolas, um, Governor Nicolás de Obando made him lieutenant of Juan Esquivel, who was engaged in pacifying the province of Higüey in Hispaniola. It was at Higüey that Ponce learned about the natives of San Juan who came to trade with the Spaniards. In the first voyage uh, to San Juan Bautista, Ponce de Leon was accompanied by 50 conquistadors, among them a freed black man named Juan Garrido, and a mulatto named Francisco Mexia. Whenever or wherever Spaniards set foot in the Americas, as members of conquest companies, they were accompanied by black conquistadors. Most of the historiography of blacks in the New World has sent, uh, concentrated in Juan Garrido. And there is a very interesting uh, Provenza that means a proof of merit. Dated uh, September 27, 1538, uh, to the king uh, that claimed that Provenza, I, Juan Garrido, black in color of this city, says he of his own free will became a Christian in Lisbon, was in Castile for seven years and crossed to Santo Domingo where he remained an equal length of time. From there, he visited other islands and then went to San Juan de Puerto Rico where he spent much time. After which he came to the new Spain, appeared before your majesty and state that I am in need of making a Provenza to the perpetuity of the king a report on how I serve your majesty in the conquest and pacification of New Spain. From the time that the Marquez del Valle, Hernán Cortés, entered it, and in his company I was pres uh, present at all the invasions and conquests and pacifications which were carried out, always with the uh, said Marquez, all that I did at my own expense without being given either a salary or allotment of native or anything else. Another of Ponce's companions was a mulatto named Francisco Mexia. Together with his freed father, Anton Mexia, Nicolás de Obando recruited them in Seville. Anton was married um, to a woman named Violante uh, Gomez. Violante Gomez. There are no references uh, to, to Violante's life. Just she appears uh, in one reference as the mother of, of, of Anton. Um, but it could be assumed that she was either a Morisca, a white slave that converted from Islam, or maybe even a white Spaniard woman. As Anton was black, and Francisco, their son, was mulatto. According to Ruth P uh, Pike, black and white slaves and freedmen and freedwoman uh, had friendly relations in Seville, where miscegenation and common law unions were frequent. And even members of the clergy man maintained illicit relations with female household slaves, and in some instances, even recognized their illegitimate children. So Francisco decided to accompany Ponce de Leon in the colonization of San Juan Bautista in 1508. He worked for de Leon as a supervisor of his encomienda of Amerindians, working in the mines and in the gold smelting of 1511 registered that for de Leon, 730 pieces of gold. He also worked for the crown, picking Amerindians to work in the mines, receiving a stable salary of 50, uh, 50 pesos of gold a year. As you know, men, women, and children were forced to work long hours um, in, in the mines and washing in the river, right, the gold, trying to uh, get gold. The ill treatment of the native precipitated a great rebellion in 1513 against the Spaniards, but also against the caciques or chief towns townsmen or women uh, that were helping them by offering natives to work in the mines. 
when Francisco was picking natives from the Cacique Luisa, the native liberators burned the village, killing her and Francisco. The lives of Anton Mexia and Francisco and Juan Guerrido are important for several reasons. One of them is the fact that notwithstanding some discrimination, they also uh, were able to enjoy some privilege like bearing arms and owning investments. So during the half of the, the second half of the 16th century, Spanish colonizers reacted against free blacks by then limiting their opportunities and privilege in society. As in Spain, freedmen were excluded from part practicing certain jobs, such as gilders, hatters, uh, silk spinning, chandlers, uh, or painters. Another sector in which black freedmen were excluded was the military. The examples of Francisco Mexia and Juan Guerrido um, seek to exist by 15, and by 1573, there were no black freedmen enlisted in the military or allowed to carry weapons. Now, the same restrictions that were enforced in Spain against uh, Judeo conversos were taking shape through racial indicatives as free blacks were not distinguished from black slaves. Um, so during the first decade of the conquest of Puerto Rico, black slaves were mostly introduced as domestic servers uh, to the conquistadors who probably brought them from, from Spain. Uh, not only, um, and then that was also the kind of a st starting point as the in Amerindian population decreased, um, you know, these guys uh, needed people to keep on working in the mines and then after the uh, sugar cane fields. So then black slaves were brought in mass to Puerto Rico. Um, as all of you know, the major players in the introduction of Af African slaves in mass uh, to Puerto Rico was the Roman Catholic Church and the Spanish monarchy, who were both deeply complicit in organizing the social infrastructure of Puerto Rico through the introduction of slaves. To affirm that the discovery encounter quickly became domination and conquest really does not then solve the fundamental question of the goals and objectives of the Spanish protagonists nor is the exploitation of natural resources and material interests alone the objects of the causes. The principal participants in the debate about the conquest pointed to another objective that was of, the reli of a religious and transcendental nature, the Christianization of the new lands. So the principal objective presented was the conversion of the natives Evangelization was the theoretical banner that the Spanish state waged uh, during the conquest. The Christian religion became the official ideology for imperial expansion. This is clearly seen in the bulas of Paul, uh, Pope Alexander VI, the most important being Intercatera, which carried with the, the, the donation in perpetuity to the Spanish crown of the discovered and be discovered lands. So the evangelization of the natives has an important political consequence. The missionary task implies political hegemony. The effective Christianization of the discovered lands becomes or becomes the juridical theological foundation for the donation in perpetuity of political authority. So the same rationalism to evangelize the natives as a way to compensate their miserable condition as slaves and bring them from darkness to the light of the Roman Catholic Church was used with black slaves. Um, let me skip some because time is running. Um, so in the midst, in the first two centuries of the conquest of Puerto Rico, many cases of miscegenation took place among various ethno uh, racial groups. Spaniards took indigenous, morisca, and black women as concubines and African freedmen and runaway slaves also took indigenous women as wives and concubines. Although Spanish um, origins and whiteness were prized commodities to secure a place in uh, the upper strata of society, people frequently transgressed social, uh, racial boundaries. However, the mixing of the races did not create a better society which was always ruled by white elites, 
because for them, racial impurity disqualified individuals from citizenship and responsibilities. So as in the case of the status of purity of blood to exclude Judeo conversos, now the litmus test for exclusion will be based on the individual's taint of black or Amerindian blood. So let's keep on rolling and let's now move from Spain. Um, let's move from Spain to then um, the role, because remember, this is the role of uh, empires in, in how race was constructed. So now we shift from Spain to the U.S. Um, when General Nelson M Miles arrived on the coast of Guanica, uh, Puerto Rico in 1898, he said, we have not come to make war upon the people of a country that for centuries has been oppressed, but on the contrary, to bring you protection, to promote your prosperity, and to bestow upon you the immunities and blessings of the liberal institutions of our government. As a surprise, yeah. Um, as a surprise to Puerto Ricans, on August 12, 1898, the Treaty of Paris officially ceded Puerto Rico and Guam to the United States, while Cuba gained its independence. Within 18 months, the U.S. Congress passed the Foraker Act, making Puerto Rico the first in unincorporated territory of the U.S. According to Manuel Maldonado Dennis, the United States envisioned Puerto Rico as one of its new territories, part of its attempt to expand its markets and control the Caribbean militarily. Puerto Rico thus became the first colony of the United States, initiating a process in which the island became an object of the political, economic, cultural, and ideological apparatus of the United States. Um, so together with the new imperial power came Protestant missionaries, from all denominations uh, that saw the new mission fields as being ready for the harvest with the Protestant version of the gospel. William Hopkinson argued that the period between 1880 and, uh, to 1910, North American missionary efforts were directed by a post-millennial theology of civilization as the primary element in mission practice. Mission as civilization. Um, as you can see, the Missionary Review, uh, Review of the World read, the momentous war with Spain seems destined to cause a, uh, changes in the policy of the United States and to greatly influence our future. It also uh, already gives evidence of being the means of furthering the progress of the kingdom of God on earth. Another editorial read, the present war with Spain has an important religious and missionary bearing. The government of Spain has denied uh, to her colonies religious as well as civil liberties and has kept them in moral direness as well as material pro, uh, depression. In this regard, many missionaries uh, follow uh, suit in bringing the Protestant gospel to Puerto Rico. One of the... Um, one of the most vocal theologians uh, was at that period Josiah Strong, uh, who was the central, uh, the general secretary of the um, mission uh, society of the Congregational Church. And as you can see, uh, his theology was quite um, imperial, imperialistic, <laughs> uh, to say the least, right? So his perception of the Anglo-Saxon race as superior and as having a divine command to Americanize or civilize the world play a crucial role in the uh, imperialist discourse of the U.S. Uh, to the world. Um, this attitude of superiority um, dominated the encounter between Anglo-American missionaries and Puerto Rican and corroborated many of the missionaries. Uh, views on, on how they saw the Puerto Rican people. For example, how, uh, Howard B. Groves pointed out, the Anglo-Saxon is superior in initiative and resourcefulness. The Latin knows the Anglo-Saxon methods as different from his and also superior. Whatever his air of courtesy, however graciously he may seem to accept the inevitable, deep down there is a race barrier that had yet never been overcome. 
many students of the race think it will never, never can be. All that he can hope for is a peaceable and friendly and mutually serviceable models viewing this. So it is interesting that the same description or discourse that white Creoles elite use against blacks and mulattoes was also employed against them by protestant missionaries. For example, in 1765, the prelate of San Juan, Mariano Martí, affirmed how difficult it was for him to differentiate who was white or black because of the population mixing. In comparison, groups stated that Puerto Ricans, so they, they changed the U, Porto, um, Puerto Ricans are more homogeneous than Cubans, and there is no distinction, uh, distinct color line, nor can uh, be one drawn. One thing that both white girls and elite protestant missionaries shared was the exclusion of blacks uh, from what constituted the Puerto Rican. Creole elites uh, wanted to represent the island as harmonious, stable, industrious, and affirming their whiteness and excluding any black element in it uh, from their discourse, and protestants did the same. Uh, somehow the black element of the population disappeared. Uh, Cruz pointed out, oh my, um, this is, I have a lot here. Um, <laughs> yeah, because now it's the Protestant missionaries, it's for you more than the Spanish. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, let's read some of the quotes. You may find Moshe track in the cities, but you will remember longest the country scenery and the welcome you receive from those who are classed as Hibaros. There is no better blood in the island that flows in the veins of many of the descendants of the Indians and Spanish. As you can see, African blood disappeared from the discourse. Um, the, another missionary down in Puerto Rico, this is John M. Falls in 1910, argues that the whites of Puerto Rico must be considered in an entirely different sense of, uh, from Europeans and North American whites. They, they represent a genus of their own, the Puerto Rican white. Wow. Yeah. As you can see here, um, for false, uh, the verbal and nonverbal expressions of Puerto Ricans were, were disturbing. He pointed out, in the plazas where they gather in groups of two, uh, or more, instead of a quiet and friendly conversation, you heard every uh, group talking in high and loud tones. Hallelujah! <laughs> so uh, that the plaza sounds like a schoolyard for children. Uh, so this attitude of speaking loud was learned from the Spaniards that trained Puerto Ricans to be as light-hearted and irresponsible as a set, as a set of children. Right? Um, more of the same, right? Uh, Charles then did Whaler, a Baptist missionary, wrote the waiting aisles. They look upon us as little children to a big old brother, proud to have been free from Spanish autocracy and to be under the protection of the most liberal of democracies and cherishing the hope of ultimately independence by our aid. So you see here, Colombian Uncle Sam, a plug gift from the, our Christian tree, including law and order, technology, and education for the overseas uh, territories. You can see also how uh, Protestant missionaries, um, somehow um, the whole issue of, of uh, civilization uh, was completely transplanted to Puerto Rico. You can see that especially in the temples that these people uh, constructed. For example, you can see the Presbyterian Church, you can see the Methodist Episcopal Church, um, you can see the structure of the United Brethren and the First Baptist that was remodeled. Uh, and then the issue that they don't show you is that besides these cathedrals, uh, there were uh, houses of uh, uh, wood, right, and sink in the top and dirt one in the floor. And so poverty, complete, uh, some uh, poverty besides uh, a transplantation of a middle class kind of Protestantism. Um, so making them American. Already the English language saturated with Christian ideals gathering upon itself the best thought of all the ages. It is the great agent of Christian civilization throughout the world. 
at this moment affecting the destinies and moldings of the character of half of the human race. So that was followed by George, uh, George Falls and Charles De Wigler arguing that, um, argue that the best way to Americanize Puerto Ricans was if the people learned to read American literature, literature and, become, and come to know our ideals as a nation, uh, national life, if they are able to converse in an intelligent manner with American officials and citizens who reside in Puerto Rico. It will not be long until these people shall be truly American. And Charles Dead will argue, ought not the Puerto Ricans be embraced uh, to embrace the religion of their liberators as well as the other elements of their civilization? So making them Americans. Um, <laughs> This is very important. Time is up, but this is very important. One, one minute, one minute. Um, if you can like put, put the clip, uh, there is a clip of this uh, El Rubio de Galilea, the Blonde of Galilee, and this is how it is perpetuated from generation to generation. And hopefully he will put the, the clip right away. It's coming. It's coming. So El Rubio de Galilea, the Blonde of Galilee, right? And look who is singing the Blonde of Galilee. Rubio de Galilea, right? Right? So you can see this in my in my PowerPoint presentation that they will uh, share with you and in my in my essay. Uh, so you can turn it off. But what the boys and girls are singing is that the blood of Galilee is passing through here. Let him touch him, let him touch him, and receive the blessing. So right, they're very like, kind of perpetuating how then uh, uh, Jesus is seen as a blonde guy from Galilee. Um, yeah. And then... <laughs> but that's not only the case. For example, for example... Um, look at the world, uh, at the baseball team in the World Baseball Classic, right? That was like this year. So you will wonder why these guys are painted with their uh, hair blonde. What happened here? So, right? Um, so, and then the mayor of uh, Puerto, the governor also had the blonde, right? Uh, dyed his hair blonde. And then um, one of the, the left fielders said, uh, I'm translating, all teams has something. Italians uh, throw kisses. I don't know what Mexicans have. Dominicans have uh, plantain and, and music, uh, merengue. But so we have, uh, we dye our hairs of blonde because we understand uh, that we have to do this. We are the rubitos, the blondies of Puerto Rico. So I was like, I was like, okay, how, how, how you being a brown person want to be blonde? Uh, it doesn't make sense to me, right? Uh, but that's how then colonialism works. You want to be like your master. You want to somehow imitate, mimic, and, 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 and see uh, how that works. And as I was reading, reading history and trying to understand, like, then a counter-narrative, suddenly, finally appears someone that had a different mentality. Howard T. John Jason, right, is the exception of the missionaries. In 1901, he goes to Puerto Rico. He uh, becomes completely uh, contextualized in Puerto Rican society. He builds a temple. He uh, buys land. He do all these things, right? But guess what? He was an African, uh, African-American missionary. Uh, the only missionary that contextualized the gospel in Puerto Rico was Howard T. Jason. And the interesting thing is that none of the missionaries were recognized today. I mean, you can ask who is gross, who is like all these people, no one knows. But this guy had a complex, sport complex in the city of Corozal name under his name. So it's a huge, huge, huge uh, sport complex. So he is the one that people remember. The one who ate with the Puerto Rican, time is up. Um, mestizaje and mulates, uh, I'm sorry, um, it's, time is up. But, <laughs> yeah. Oh.